hello so yes we are we are now streamlining uh we're, we invite we just admit we're admitting everybody here on on the waiting list there's a few people still entering the waiting room here uh welcome welcome as everybody's setting up their audio here on zoom welcome uh please as we're about to start just meet yourselves we are getting ready to go on this first day of january 2023 Welcome, Violetta. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? How is everyone? Well, I'll... We can't hear you, John. You're muted. Oh, wow. I was just talking to myself for how long now? Oof. Well, Violetta, we all want to thank you for joining us today, this morning this first day of January 2023, we thank you for being the one to start it off with us this year. We really, really appreciate that we have you here for a subject equally important to last week on the subject of remarkable stories from Baha'i history. And this Sunday for everybody here is a classic story set is a classic storytelling session with many remarkable stories from the Babi and Baha'i histories. It spans the ministries of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, Shoya Effendi, and it includes several stories about Hands of the Cause. And this session, as we're starting off this beautiful year on a new footing, it's meant to delight, astonish, inspire, and move you. And we are so happy to have Violetta with us. She is uh, having presented with us last week, equally, equally important. If you haven't seen it, please go to Clue Water Baha'is on YouTube, the channel. Go to the Clue Water Baha'is channel. Look it up, the one with Violetta from last week. We welcome you to watch all the videos, really. But look at last week's video. It's definitely worth a watch. We ask that you know that uh, we've, we've been introducing her then. We're going to introduce her again because she's done a lot of amazing things that you should also be aware of and use those resources. There's a place you can visit online called The Utterance Project. And she's with Adib Masumian launched this YouTube channel called The Utterance Project. And they also have a website dedicated to this. It's dedicated to sharing the beauty of the utterances of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, and Abdul Baha in the original Persian and Arabic. So we're talking about having read aloud to you the writings as they were originally written. And you can listen to them as they should be pronounced. And further, you're able to also understand what they mean in English, yes, but at the same time, you're able to really absorb the originality of what was written first. So there's nothing that really uh, goes beyond that in your access to the Baha'i writings, looking at the original script as it was written. Further, she's illustrated two chronologies, the extraordinary life of Abdul Baha and the Blessed Beauty. The Blessed Beauty is another title for Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. That being said, we look forward to starting off today, Violetta, on this beautiful first day of January with a beautiful presentation. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's always such a pleasure and Take such what? an honor to come to the Clearwater Zoom and be able to talk about such extraordinary things from Baha'i history. So. Today, like John said, is a classic storytelling session, which is unlike what I usually do. I usually have a theme going through the whole talk, and the theme this time is that all of these stories are remarkable. Um, they're going to be about 10 short stories, and they span from 50 years before the Declaration of the Bab from 1793, all the way to 1933. 140 years after the, the Declaration of the Bab. Um, and so they, they span the heroic age of the faith and the first epoch of the formative age. Um, the stories are basically about spiritual patterns and connections, um, things that I noticed when I was writing the chronologies that I wrote. 
and uh, they're all very, very moving. And some are maybe better known than others. Uh, and and um, so, like uh, like John said, they're meant to inspire us and move us and astonish us, mostly spur us on in our service to the beloved Universal House of Justice as we start this new nine-year plan. And that's my commitment, is to create content that elevates us and, and makes us fall in love over and over again with our spiritual history. Uh, the first story I want to tell you about is something I discovered in, in uh, chapter 19 of the Dawnbreakers, about eight paragraphs before the end of chapter 19. Uh, Nabil has an absolutely extraordinary parallel between the persecutions of the Bab and the persecutions of Baha'u'llah. And I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to tell you what they are, and then I wanted to uh, go through each of these persecutions in the words of Nabil, in the order in which he wrote this little paragraph uh, in chapter 19. So um, this is sort of the map of the persecutions. There are three imprisonments of the Bab and one bastinado, one torture, and there's three imprisonments of Baha'u'llah and also the same torture. So we're going to start now with the beginning of the sentence from Nabil. The first confinement that the Bab suffered at the hands of his enemies was in the house of Abdul Hamid Khan, the chief constable of Shiraz. Now what happened was in the summer of 1846, uh, the Bab and his wife Khadija Bagum were sleeping on the roof and authorities, under orders by the governor, broke in confiscated every book and every piece of writing and arrested the Bab and put him under lock and key in the house of Abdul Hamid Khan, the chief constable of Chiraz. And all those widely rumored that the Bab was going to be executed through the intervention of his mother and two of his female family members, um, he was not executed and he returned home. Nabil continues, the first confinement of Baha'u'llah was in the home of the Kalkula of Tehran. So uh, about 700 or 900 kilometers north of Shiraz and um, a year and a half after the Bab's first imprisonment, Baha'u'llah's first imprisonment took place and it was also, interestingly, for a few days and also in the home of an official of the government. The Kalkula is kind of like um, uh, a neighborhood kind of official. Um, his name was Khusrau, Khusrau Khan, and uh, he was, Baha'u'llah was arrested after he revisited the Babi detainees from Ghazvin, who had been accused of murdering the cousin of, of Tahere. And um, Nabil continues, the Babs, second imprisonment was in the castle of Mahku. So in April 1847, the Bab was imprisoned in Mahku. In three short years, the Bab's message had already changed the social fabric. He had aroused hope and excitement among people from every walk of life. And because they were threatened by his growing influence, and his teachings, uh, the clergy and the government decided to destroy him and they banished him from city to city. Finally, uh, in the spring of 1847, the Bab was courteously invited um, and assigned, assigned to Mahku. Uh, it, was a, it was a castle fortress in Azerbaijan and the Bab would call this prison the Open Mountain. Nabil continues, that of Baha'u'llah was in the private residence of the governor of Amu. So Baha'u'llah's second imprisonment took place in December 1848, one year after his first confinement and 20 months after the second incarceration of the Bab in the fortress of Maku. Uh, Baha'u'llah was, uh, he was kept in the mosque in Amu, apprehended as he was uh, traveling towards Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Tabarsi. Sheikh Tabarsi. He wanted to visit the, the, 
he he wanted to visit the the people who were in Sheikh Tabarsi and he got arrested on the way there. Um, now for the rest of the the sentence of Nabil, the first half of the rest. The Bab was scourged in the Namaz Kani of the Sheikhul Islam of Tabriz. Uh, three months after his arrival in Chirik, the Bab was tortured publicly in July 1848. Um, he was brought before a panel and the 17-year-old Crown Prince Nasruddin Mirza was presiding. And um, this public forum was intended for the Bab to recant his faith. But instead what happened is that the Bab turned it into a formal and public declaration of his mission. So it was, it was during this sort of failure and humiliation of the government of Persia that the clergy, uh, that it just backfired so badly on the clergy that they then tortured the Bab by bastinado. Now, bastinado, I want to just make a little pause and explain that bastinado was a very common form of torture in, in Persia in the 19th century. It's basically foot whipping, um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's the cruelest form of torture in the sense that it is meant to inflict the maximum amount of pain while never endangering the victim's life so that they can live to feel that pain. Because the feet have the most nerve endings of anywhere in the body, and so when you whip naked so uh, soles of a person's foot, the pain is, is unbearable and they're often made to walk on their lacerated feet. So this is what our beloved Bob endured. Um, the same indignity, Nabil says, was inflicted on Baha'u'llah in the Namaz Kani of the Mujtahid of Amul. Now I believe the Bab was also bastinadoed in a namaz kani. You see, there's another parallel. Uh, so what happened is after, uh, after Baha'u'llah was arrested, they were going to bastinado some of his companions, but Baha'u'llah asked to be tortured first, and he was uh, whipped uh, in front of the assembled ulamas of Amu. The Bab's third confinement, continues Nabil, was in the castle of Shirik. So this is the third imprisonment of the Bab. On the 10th of, on the 10th of April, 1848, nine months after arriving in Mahku, the Bab was transferred to the fortress at Shirik and his incarceration conditions really became much worse. Uh, he wasn't even allowed a lamp. Um, his tablets that date from this period uh, speak about his sufferings and are very agonizing to read. Um, the conditions at Chirik were so harsh and the warden was very cruel and unpredictable. And the Bab would spend the remaining two years of his uh, life under the worst of all incarcerations. And he called Chirik the grievous mountain. And the end of the sentence, uh, no, there's actually something coming after this from Nabil, but the Baha'u'llah's Bahá third imprisonment was in the Siat Chal of Tehran. Now the parallel here again is that as with the, the Bab's imprisonment in Chirik, that was the grievous mountain, was the worst of his imprisonments, Baha'u'llah's third imprisonment in the Siat Chal was also the worst. And also because of the conditions, uh, same as with the Bab, um, although he had a chain weighing 50 kilograms on his, on, his, on his neck. So four years and four months after the Bab's third imprisonment, Bahá'u'lláh was imprisoned for the last time in Persia, because he was imprisoned elsewhere after, uh, for six months, from the 16th of August, 1852, to around mid-December, 1852, following the attempt on the life of the Shah by the three crazed babis. And, and the... And the his imprisonment was part of the, of the reprisals from the government. And this was during this period in mid-October, uh, four months after he was imprisoned in August, that Baha'u'llah uh, received the divine revelation uh, from God through the, the, the maiden, that he was the promised one 
announced by the Bob. And I really encourage you to go to the YouTube um, channel of the Utterance Project and look for a poem called Rashiyama, The Clouds from the Realms Above. It is a mystical poem by Baha'u'llah composed during his incarceration in the Siachal. It is the earliest known emanation of his mind and it speaks about the conditions and it speaks about the revelation of, of, of God and uh, you could hear it in Persian. It is the most heartbreaking and extraordinary experience. And now Nabil brings everything together in two in, in one in in in, a, in in two halves of a sentence the bab whose trials and sufferings had preceded in almost every case those of baha'u'llah had offered himself to ransom his beloved from the perils that beset that precious life in other words the bab offered himself agreed accepted to be foot with, to be incarcerated in worse and worse conditions, to prevent Baha'u'llah from going through the same sufferings. But we have twin manifestations in this, in this revelation. And this is where the mystery uh, occurs. Whilst Baha'u'llah on his part, unwilling that he, the Bab, who so greatly loved him, should be the sole sufferer shared at every turn the cup that touched his lips. Such love no eye ever beheld, nor has mortal heart conceived such mutual devotion. If the branches of every tree were turned into pens and the seas to ink, the earth and the heavens rolled into one parchment, the immensity of that love would remain unexplored and the depths of that devotion unfathomed. So what, what Nabil does in this, in, this, in this paragraph in chapter 19 is really extraordinary because he first sets off to show us that the Bab and Baha'u'llah were both imprisoned three times and tortured once in Persia. But then he brings the analysis to a higher level by showing how not only did the Bab agree to, to suffer these indignities so that Baha'u'llah would be spared, but that Baha'u'llah for his love for the Bab did not want him to suffer alone and suffered each of these in turn after his prophet Harold. Now, I was extremely privileged when I was writing the the the, the online chronology of life of Baha'u'llah called The Blessed Beauty. You can also find it on the, on the Utterance Project website. It's in 10 parts and it's about 400 pages and about 1500 images. A lot of them are pieces of art that I created to elevate uh, the content uh, to be befitting for the blessed beauty. Um, I was very privileged to have two Iraqi Baha'i collaborators, Saad Salim and Abir Majid, and through our, our very intense collaboration over several months, I learned something I did not know about the spiritual importance of Iraq and the Baha'i faith. And I gave a talk a few months ago. Um, it's the second talk called How Baha'u'llah Recreated the Babi Community of Baghdad that touches on this subject. But what I want to do here is show you all of the intersecting points between Iraq and the Babi and Baha'i faith in a row. Uh, to show you really uh, uh, the, the pattern, the spiritual pattern with Iraq here. Now, speaking of his two-year retirement in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. Now, Kurdistan is a very important place because it belongs to three or more countries. And so the significance of Baha'u'llah being in Kurdistan, the Kurds, wherever in the world they reside, are exceptional people. Uh, of an exceptional uh, spiritual acumen. And the first emanations of the glory of Baha'u'llah were in Kurdistan. So Kurdistan is very important in our uh, Baha'i culture. Um, and so Baha'u'llah spoke of his time there and, and essentially said that his time in Iraqi Kurdistan was the mightiest testimony and the most perfect and conclusive evidence of his revelation.
So our first connection with Iraq takes place 50 years before the declaration of Bab, when Sheikh Ahmadi Ahsai uh, left, he left his home in Saudi Arabia around the age of 40 and began studying Shia doctrine in Karbila, a holy city of Iraq. Uh, and for 20 years before going to Persia at the same time that Baha'u'llah and the Bab were born. Um, but Sheikh Ahmad Yassai was a visionary and he knew there was something wrong with the way people were, were practicing Islam and he knew that something was going to come, that a renewal was going to come and he knew in fact that two luminaries would arise during his lifetime. When he passed away, he gave his school to, um, before passing away, he left his school in the hands of Sayyid Kazimi Rashti, a Persian uh, that uh, Sheikh, Kaze, uh, Sheikh Ahmad had met in Persia when he was traveling uh, at the time. And now he was also based in Karbila and faithful to his master, Sayyid Kazim prepared more intensely his students for the arrival of the Bab. Speaking of the Bab, the Bab visited Karbila, Iraq, where Seed Kazim was busy studying and preparing the way for his arrival in 1841, after his seven month pilgrimage to Mecca. And he actually met Seed Kazim. And, and, and Seed Kazim actually directly pointed at the Bab, saying that it was, he was as, um, if I remember correctly, something in the vein of he was as visible as the ray of light on one's lap at the moment that a ray of light fell on the Bob's lap. But none of his students were able to pierce the veil that was in front of their eyes and no one recognized him other than Seed Kazim. Now, Seed Kazim and Sheikh Ahmad wrote volumes and Tahere discovered a book in one of her cousin in her, one of her cousin's house and immediately knew that she was reading the truth so she instantly became a disciple of Seed Kazim and she exchanged letters with him very regularly and uh, I think she dis she managed to convince her family that she should travel alone to Iraq um, uh, to, she should travel alone to Iraq with a, with a companion, and she arrived 10 days after Seed Kazim's passing. With the permission of the widow of Seed Kazim, Tahere set up the school again and started teaching Seed Kazim students in Seed Kazim's old um, um, classrooms from behind a veil uh, uh, and was given access to unpublished materials. Um, during this time, when Mullah Hussein had now gone in search for the Promised One and was making his way to, um, to Shiraz, uh, she had a dream of the Bab while she was in Iraq. And then shortly after the declaration of the Bab, the manuscript of the Qayyumul Asma, the commentary on the Suri of Joseph, which the Bab revealed during his first night, uh, the declaration with with uh, Mullah Hussein made its way uh, to Karbila and she opened the book and she read it and inside the book were the verses that the Bab had spoken to her in the dream. Now before you ask, we do not know what these verses are. I found a letter from the House of Justice that was not too old that states that we still do not know what those verses were exactly. She wrote a letter to the Bab she became the 17th letter of the living, the only woman to hold that great honor. And she, she continued to teach really, really intensely in Iraq for three years until she was deported. She taught with such courage and such intensity and such fearlessness and fierceness, like challenging the ulamas to public confrontations that we call in Persia, that uh, the Persians call mubahile. It's a, it's a tradition in, in Islam to publicly debate, to publicly confront. So she was deported. And even while she was being deported, in her hauda, leaving Iraq to go back to Persia, she kept teaching. Um, so another connection is also Mullah Hussein, of course, because Mullah Hussein arrived in Karbila because he began, became uh, a, a disciple of Seed Kazim. And so he, he left, uh, he returned from a mission in Persia 12 days after Tahiri had arrived. 
So 22 days after the passing of, of, uh, of Seed Kazim. And when he found out what Seed Kazim's last words were, which were to disperse, disperse, find him, find the promised one. He said, why haven't you all left? Everybody gave different excuses. And he spent 40 days in contemplation and immediately left. And then immediately found the Bab. As, I mean, he, he just, it was pretty, uh, he just left and then sailed to Persia and made his way to Shiraz and found the Bab on his first day in Shiraz. And of course, the last connection to Iraq is Baha'u'llah and of course Abdul Baha and of course the rest of the Holy Family including Mirza Musa, Asiye Hanum, Bahi Hanum, uh, Mirza Mehdi and then baby Ali Muhammad who passed away while Baha'u'llah was in um, Kurdistan. Now Baha'u'llah had already visited Kurdis, uh, uh, Karbila in 1851, 1852 when he was uh, quote unquote strongly encouraged to leave Persia by the prime minister. So it was a year before the, the, the attempted assassination of the Shah. Tensions had gotten very high and Baha'u'llah was the most visible Babi. So, uh, and, and, and the Bab had just been, um, just been martyred, just been executed. So Baha'u'llah was the only one left. So he was encouraged to leave, uh, leave Iran for a little bit. So he left for about eight months. Um, and then returned to Persia, of course, as we said, was imprisoned in the Siachal. Then when he was released, he chose to go to Iraq. He was offered other destinations, but he chose to go to Iraq. And uh, it was in Iraq that the first emanations of the Baha'u'llah's mind uh, were, were revealed in Kurdistan before he left for Kurdistan. Baha'u'llah revealed several outstandingly important tablets that were just so brilliant that Mirza Yahya was just devouring himself with jealousy over them, um, including the tablet, Lahi Kulutam, the tablet of all food, where Baha'u'llah gives an extraordinary uh, explanation of a very obscure verse in, in the Quran. Um, it was also where the first Babi community was born, and it was, of course, where Baha'u'llah chose to uh, make his declaration 19 years after the declaration of the Bab, nine years after his declaration, his revelation in the Siachal, after the appointed time had been, uh, had been lifted. So some connections with Iraq. Um, now, there are two stories here that are very short that I want to share with you. They are basically the love of Baha'u'llah for the people of Baghdad and the love of Abdu'l-Bahá for the people of Baghdad and Iraq in general. So um, a very unique aspect of Baha'u'llah's life. Now, this is not the old lady that I'm going to be speaking about, my friends. This is an 80-year-old lady from the 19th century in Iraq, but it is not the one that we're going to be talking about in this story. I just want to make that clear. Um, so the very unique aspect of Baha'u'llah's life in Iraq was how much time he spent in contact with people. He spent three hours a day in cafes. He received everyone in his house himself. People always knew where to find him because he never moved. This is the only place where he were ever exiled that he never changed houses. So he was in the most great house for seven years. Um, and so he was either in the most great house or in one of the several cafes that he frequented. These were the places where people knew they could find him. Uh, and, and, they, and they, they, they searched for him and they sought him out and Baha'u'llah spoke to them. This does not happen after. After this, you will never see this again in Baha'u'llah's life. Um, and and, and Baha'u'llah absolutely loved, loved the people of Baghdad. So because Baha'u'llah had such a very predictable schedule, there was an old lady about 80 years old who would always wait for Baha'u'llah at the same place by the side of the road and uh, on the, that was on his way to his coffee shop. And so Baha'u'llah, every day, the, man of, the supreme manifestation of God, every day, would always stop and inquire about her health and give her a little bit of money, and she would kiss his hands. And then she would, on her tiptoes, try to reach up and kiss him on his face, face. but he was too tall, so Baha'u'llah would bend down so she could reach his face to kiss him. And when he was speaking about this very charming woman, uh, Baha'u'llah said, she knows that I like her. That is why she likes me. Uh, I particularly love that this is such a humble statement. 
obviously this woman loved Baha'u'llah because he was Baha'u'llah. Something emanated from him that was, that was divine. But Baha'u'llah says, she knows that I like her. <laughs> that is why she likes me. I think that's also a good lesson for us. If we like people, they will feel our love for them. But the nicest part of this story for me, personally, um, because of the attention and the care and the empathy that it, that it, that it translates, is that when Baha'u'llah left Iraq, uh, he made arrangements so that this old lady would receive a daily allowance until she died. I just love this story. And of course, Abdul Baha, there are, I mean, this would be the subject of another talk, but there are so many parallels in Abdul Baha's character that are reflections of Baha'u'llah's character. And this is a perfect example. Um, uh, this is a story I discovered when I was uh, writing the extraordinary life of Abdul Baha for the centenary. I found it in the diary of Juliet Thompson when she was in Tonon les Bains with, uh, with Abdul Baha. And uh, what made this very special was that I searched for about four months for a photograph of thorn pickers and I never found one. And my friend Ismail Velasco, who obviously has great ninja skills in searching was able to find this uh, picture of this. Now, the people you see here in the photograph next to Abdul Baha are thorn pickers in, in Iraq. Um, what they have on their backs are thorn bushes. And it was, a, it was basically the job that the poorest people who had no other choice would do in Iraq because you can imagine that if you're picking these dry thorn bushes that makes your hands bleed. Um, so they were very, very, very poor. And uh, so uh, the story is about them. Um, so on the, on the 25th of August, 1911, Abdul Baha was in this beautiful, I've been there, it's gorgeous, lakeside town of Tonon les Bains with Juliet Thompson and Tamadun ul Mulk, his interpreter. Very short guy, very vain. He wore a corset. Uh, to, I guess stand up straight or make him thinner. <laughs> Anyway, Abdul Baha would tease him about that. Um, so Tamad al-Mulk was very vain and he always wanted to see castles and fancy places. And so he gave Abdul Baha a booklet on Warwick Castle, which I believe is in Scotland. Uh, and uh, Abdul Baha has pushed the book aside and, and says, what do I care about castles? And he proceeds to remember a, a, a day about so how many years ago would it have been it would have been maybe 50 years ago uh that that left a profound impression on him so in baghdad and and throughout the middle east the summers are extremely hot they can get up to 45 degrees celsius which is about 120 degrees fahrenheit and um abdul Baha had been invited to the hut of a thorn picker i mean they were so poor they lived in huts not houses the hut of a thorn picker, and he, it was, it's called camel thorn, um, it's, it's a, yeah, it, it looks exactly like that. You can only sell it for people to use it for fuel, or use it for fuel yourself to cook your food with it. Uh, so this thorn picker had invited Abdul Baha to his home, and Abdul Baha walked 12 miles, 25 kilometers, in the heat of the hot sun, to go to this thorn picker's house, whose wife was so happy that Abdul Baha had come, that she, uh, she had made a cake with a little bit of meal, and she was so happy that she burnt the cake. And uh, Baha'u'llah would say, uh, well, I'm just gonna tell the story in Abdul Baha's, I forgot that I had this, so I'm gonna reread this. In Abdul Baha's own words, uh, once when I lived in Baghdad, I was invited to the house of a poor thorn picker. In Baghdad, the heat is greater even than in Syria. There was a, it was a very hot day, but I walked 12 miles to the thorn picker's hut. Then his wife made a little cake out of some meal for me and burnt it in cooking it so that it was black, hard lump. Still, it was the best reception I ever attended. And I think that to me, that story is, speaks volumes about Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha. How his father was called the father of the poor 
during his first nine years of marriage before he became a Babi. And when Abdul Baha was in Akka, he was also the father of the poor and the master of Akka. And wherever he traveled in the world, he always sought out the poor and said, I am one of you. I am only happy when I'm in the company of the poor. And to make this sentence that this 45 degree heat, 12 miles walking, you would imagine it's so hot, you would be drenched. He arrives in this hut, the cake is burnt. That's like the description of a disaster. But for Abdul Baha, it was the best reception he had. Do you imagine the spirit that must have been in that meeting for him to say that? It's amazing. It's so remarkable even. So I know that right now Russia is sort of a taboo subject because of what's happening, uh, which we won't delve into. But let's go back to Russia um, 120, uh, almost 200 years ago, 170 years ago, uh, during the life of Baha'u'llah. It was not the same place that it is today. And I want to tell you about five connections that I found with Russia and Baha'u'llah's ministry while I was writing the chronology on the life of Baha'u'llah. So in 1848 is the first connection. When, after the conference of Badasht, Baha'u'llah made his way slowly to Sheikh Tabarsi, which he visited. Uh, and he arrived in this uh, seaside town of Bandar Jazz uh, on the Caspian Sea around the 7th or the 8th of September, 1848, uh, thanks to Dr. Mujan Momin, we have an exact date for this. That's wonderful. Um, so while he was in Bandar Jazz, uh, the the Shah had uh, Muhammad Shah had decreed an edict for for Baha'u'llah's arrest, uh, and and there were Russian officials there because basically the Caspian Sea. I don't have the entire map here, but the north part of it borders Russia. So if you board a steamer in Russia and go southeast. Southeast, you can go to uh, Persia, to Bandar Jazz. So there were Russians there. And the Russian officials and the local notables that were with Baha'u'llah loved him so much and really didn't want him to be arrested. Um, so uh, they offered him to board a steamer and flee to Russia uh, and uh, on, on the northeast coast. So despite how much they, they insisted, Baha'u'llah said uh, every single instant in his life anybody offered Baha'u'llah an easy way out, the answer was always, no thank you. No thank you. I put my whole trust in God. I will not flee. I will not run. I will not turn away from it. So that, that was the first one. The Russians offered Baha'u'llah an escape. Now the second one is in 1852. Uh, after the uh, Nasruddin Shah was, uh, there was an assassination attempt on his life. Um, Baha'u'llah was in, um, where was he, in Afchi. He was in Afchi. And again, people there said, why don't you flee to Russia? Again. And again, Baha'u'llah declined. And he rode to Zarkandi, which is pictured here. It's the place where the Russian legation was, Russian embassy. Uh, he arrived on the grounds of the embassy to speak to one of his family members. And uh, he was arrested there. And the man you see on the left is Prince Dmitry Ivanovich Dolgorukov. He was a Russian minister at attaché to Persia. And he and his daughter were very, very upset by the way Baha'u'llah was treated. And his daughter especially even spoke to him publicly saying, you are a minister, you have no power to stop what's happening? Well, Baha'u'llah is innocent. And so during Baha'u'llah's four-month imprisonment in the Siachal, this man, this Russian prince, did not stop trying to obtain freedom for Baha'u'llah, to clear his name, to prove his innocence. He never, ever stopped. It was amazing. Um, this is absolutely amazing. I only have a small piece of this that I want to read to you, but I really want to read it because I want you to see how this Russian minister, this prince, advocated for Baha'u'llah in the strongest language possible. So in The Chosen Highway, uh, Lady Blumfield quotes Bahi Khanum, recounting uh, Prince Dolgorukov's plea for Baha'u'llah that left the officials in the court that were about to decide his, uh, his sentencing to death, they left them thunderstruck. He said, hearken to me, I have words of importance to say to you. 
Have you not taken enough cruel revenge? Have you not already murdered a large enough number of harmless people, all because of this accusation? The absurd falseness of which you are quite aware? There has there not been sufficient of this orgy of brutal torture to satisfy you? How is it possible that you can even pretend to think that this august prisoner planned that silly attempt to shoot the Shah? It is not unknown to you that the stupid gun used by that poor youth could not have killed a bird. Moreover, the boy was obviously insane. You know very well that this charge is not only untrue, but palpably ridiculous. There must be an end to this. I have determined to extend the protection of Russia to this innocent nobleman. Therefore, beware, for if one hair of his head to be hurt from this moment, rivers of blood shall flow in your town as punishment. You will do well to heed my warning. My country is behind me in this matter. But still, the prince didn't stop there. He offered Baha'u'llah his protection and an invitation to live in Russia. For the third time, he's invited to Russia. And Baha'u'llah, for the third time, declines, chooses instead to leave for Iraq. And the prince still does not stop there and extends one last gesture by offering an official representative of the Russian legation as Baha'u'llah's escort to the Iraqi border. I love this story. <laughs> okay, I think we only have three more connections, and they're quite short. So, um, between the 16th and 21st of August, 1868, when Baha'u'llah was in Gallipoli, um, there was a house rented for him and his family, and some of the Baha'is lived on the bottom floor, the rest of the Baha'is lived in a caravanserai, and while he was in this house, he received the visit of a German, Russian, and English ambassadors, uh, consuls. They called on him to offer him a safe haven in a Western European country. So this is, I think, the fifth time he's offered uh, uh, safe haven in a Western country. Uh, Baha'u'llah's response was the same as it always was. He declined very gracefully and stated that uh, he had no intentions of going against Sultan Abdulaziz's will and that he would never abandon his followers. And he, had, he, has, he stated that he had nothing to fear. Um, because his sole desire was only to summon the people to the word of God. This is a very interesting story. In about 1870, about approximately, it's hard to date this story, you don't exactly know when, but it's around this time. Um, so there was a, a Baha'i named uh, Agha Muhammad Rahim, who was a merchant in Isfahan, and he was on his way to Turkmenistan and stopped in a city called um, As Astarabad. Astarabad. And so there the Russian consul invited him and said, hey, you know, I have some questions for you since you're a Baha'i. Uh, in the tablet, you know, in the summons of the Lords of Hosts, uh, there's, a, there's a tablet to, um, to uh, the Tsar uh, Nicholas, Nicholas II? Alexander II. Alexander, I, I can't remember, sorry. One of them. Um, and so in the tablet addressed to the, to the Tsar of Russia, Baha'u'llah states... Alexander. It's Alexander. Thank you! Thank you so much, Tsar Alexander II. So, in the, so the consul tells uh, Aha Muhammad Rahim, in the tablet that Baha'u'llah addresses to the Tsar of Russia, it states, quote, We verily have heard the thing for which thou didst supplicate thy Lord. So his question was, what did the Tsar request in his prayer? Aha Muhammad Rahim was so afraid of saying the wrong thing. He was so afraid to respond. He had no idea what to say, but he began speaking anyway. And he said, well, to me, the rulers of the various nations desire nothing from God except assistance in defeating the enemy and conquering lands. Uh, and inasmuch as the army of Russia had been defeated in the war of Sebastopol, the Tsar in his prayers had expressed his wish to overcome the Ottoman Empire. So once he replied, he started having, <laughs> he just felt so guilty and so much anguish, doubts about his answer. So finally, he arrives in Akka sometime after 1870, and he goes to the Khani Avami, that caravanserai, and, and, and Abdul Baha comes to find him. And, uh, and Abdul Baha asks him, well, how was your conversation with the Russian consul in Astorabad? And so he explained the whole thing to him. And then Abdul Baha says, you said the right thing. Um, this is actually what Abdul Baha says. One day, so 
just think of this. This guy, Aha Muhammad Rahim, is in Astarabad with the Council of Russia. Baha'u'llah is in Akka. So that's thousands of kilometers. The, the moment that they're meeting, Baha'u'llah speaks to, his, uh, to, his, to his, those around him. At this very moment, the tablet to the Tsar of Russia is being read. The consul is asking one of the friends the nature of the request of the Tsar, and he receives the correct answer. His name is Agha Muhammad Rahim Isfahani. How amazing is that? Okay, this is the last Russian connection before we move on to another story. So uh, before I start, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the main character in this story, wh whose picture I do not have. I tried, I looked for about three weeks, I couldn't find it. Alexander Grigorievich Tumansky. So he was a Russian Orientalist. And he was a major general of the, uh, the, the Russian Imperial Army. He came from a really old aristocratic family, and he's fluent in 11 languages, including Persian, Turkish, Arabic. Anyway, he was just a genius uh, Orientalist. He, 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 was, uh, he was stationed in Ishkabad, and he became very, very good friends with the Baha'is in Ishkabad in 1889-1890. And he met Mirza Abu Fazl and remained close contact with him and the community for years. Actually, until the end of his life, he stayed in contact with them. So when the devastating news of Baha'u'llah's ascension reached, the Baha'is of Ishkabad. So can you imagine that about, about a month later? So I think it reached there on the 24th of June, 1892. Um, Tumansky was so close to the Baha'is, the Baha'is invited him to a memorial gathering in honor of Baha'u'llah. And that was held on the property of the temple, uh, on the property they purchased for the, for the house of worship, which they hadn't started building yet, which they would start building in two years. Um, and so there was already a large pool of water, there was a newly built garden, you know, houses of worship and Baha'i buildings, we plant the gardens before we build them so that when the building is finished, the garden is mature. So the believers said prayers and the read the Kitabi Aht, the Book of the Covenant, out loud. And they recited a 31 couplet Martie, which is a Persian, a very special type of Persian poem that was composed by the celebrated Baha'i poet Andalib. And he was present during the ascension. And so his Martie was about Baha'u'llah. It was a lamentation, actually, on Baha'u'llah's greatness, on his passing, on what happened there. And so shortly after this memorial gathering, evidentially, evidently he was so touched to Mansky, this, uh, this aristocratic, 11 language speaking, Russian army <laughs> general, he was so touched by this that he wrote a letter to this man, whose picture I do have, uh, the Baron, uh, what's his name? Baron um, Viktor Romanovich von Rosen. And he enclosed, uh, enclosed a letter of the poem by Andalib and the Kitabi Aht. And this man was also an Orientalist and he had an Oriental journal. Orientalist journal. So Baron von Rosen translated both documents in Russian and then he published them in 1893, one year after the passing of Baha'u'llah, in this journal called Zivorao. I mean, I don't, it's, it's, I, I don't, it's like an acronym, but Z V O R A O. Uh, the Memoirs of the Oriental Branch of the Russian Archaeological Society. That Russian publication was the very first time. The Book of the Covenant was ever published in a language, in a Western language, the first time. And it was Russian, and it was one year after the passing of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah referred to the Kitabi Aht as his most great tablet. So there must be other connections. These are only the ones I know. If you know more, please tell me in the comments at the end. So um, this is... Uh, this is more of a story, storytelling story. I want to just, I know a lot of you know about um, Thomas Breakwell's uh, story, but I do want to go through it because I do think it is one of the single most remarkable stories in Baha'i history. So, Thomas Breakwell was the first Englishman to become a Baha'i. He was also the first Englishman to make a pilgrimage to Akka. He was also the first Western believer to pay hukullah. And this is the story of his extraordinary mystical connection to Abdu'l-Baha. 
So in the summer of 1901, May Bowles, later May Maxwell, was living in Paris, and her family wanted her to leave Paris for the summer and go outside of Paris. So she wrote to Abdul Baha, and Abdul Baha wrote her to remain. He wrote to her and said, for the present, it is necessary for thee to be there and to remain with the beloved ones. Okay. So your orders are to stay in Paris. So following Abdul Baha's um, instructions to remain there, May Bowles uh, was introduced at some point later in the summer to uh, Thomas Breakwell through a friend, a mutual friend of theirs, that Thomas Breakwell sailed from England to France with on the, on the, on the, sh on the steamer. During their first meeting, it was relatively, uh, you know, not that intense. Mabel's answered Thomas Brickwell's questions on theosophy, and, and Brickwell asked if he could return the next day. Between this day and the next day, though, he had a really profound spiritual experience while he was walking down the Champs-Élysées. And this is how he told her the next day. He said, suddenly a wind struck me and whirled around me, and in that wind a voice said, with an indescribable sweetness and penetration, Christ has come again. Christ has come again. And when Thomas Breakwell asked May if he was insane, she replied, no, you are just becoming sane. Over the next three days, uh, May Bowles explained everything about the Baha'i faith to Thomas Breakwell, gave him materials to take home. And on the 8th of August, 1901, May Maxwell sent Thomas Breakwell's letter of acceptance to Baha'u'llah Abdul Baha, which read, My Lord, I believe, forgive me, thy servant, Thomas Breakwell. Now, as May Bowles was walking to put that letter in with the outgoing mail, there was a, there was a cable from the master already waiting with capital letters which said, You may leave Paris at any time. So immediately after his declaration, Thomas Breakwell just heard that some Baha'is were going to meet Abdul Baha. So he said, I'm going to. So he applied for an emergency passport and he, he got granted a very short pilgrimage, two days and two nights. So uh, when he was on pilgrimage, uh, Thomas Breakwell wrote a little letter to, uh, to May Bowles telling her, it is impossible, as you know, to express one's feelings although it is like being bathed in a sea of spiritual water and it covers the whole body, the atmosphere also seems and is different. I prayed God that he would teach me humility and he is teaching me daily for I have never felt so deeply my imperfections and my unworthiness. At times I feel as though I could throw myself at the master's feet and cry for God's mercy and indeed I will when I get a favorable opportunity. I love that. <laughs> Dr. Yunus Khan was, this was during Yunus Khan's nine years in Akka, and Dr. Yunus Khan uh, witnessed uh, Thomas Breakwell and, and spoke about his mysticism, saying, as we were in a room that looked towards Akka, there he would stand, every now and then perfectly still, facing Akka in a state of communion. This is important, communion. Whilst his eyes welled with tears, his tongue uttered, words of supplications. All those who were there were greatly moved. And Thomas Breakwell had an interview with uh, Abdul Baha, a very famous interview with Abdul Baha during his pilgrimage, during which he explained that he worked for the cotton industry and they used child labor. And, you know, he was very, he had, he felt sorrow over this practice. And he asked Abdul Baha what to do about the situation. And on hearing this, Abdul Baha simply told Thomas Breakwell, cable your resignation which Thomas Breakwell, radiantly acquiescent, did instantly. But before Thomas Breakwell left, Abdul Baha asked him to settle in Paris. So Breakwell, Thomas Breakwell returned to Paris in around mid-September 1901, and he began to send letters, often on green sheets of paper, to uh, every about every two weeks to a Baha'i who would uh, communicate replies and who, who saw Abdul Baha and communicated with Abdul Baha. And in several of these letters, Thomas Breakwell asked for sufferings to keep him mindful, saying, I ask God for calamity. I desire undiminishing pain. I long for suffering without respite. 
I yearn for enduring agony and torment so that I may not for a moment neglect the mention of my beloved. The uh, Violette Nakshavani uh, wrote the Maxwells of Montreal, that, that just amazing series on the, on the story of the Maxwells. And she has this amazing sentence in that book. She says, Thomas Breakwell was like a comet that blazed above the skies of Paris at the turn of the century. No one could equal his ardor and sincerity. No one could match the fervor of his faith. His is the story that will forever be associated with the mystery of Abdul Baha's instructions to May to stay in the French capital at all costs during that summer. His acceptance of the cause was the fruit of her obedience. In a sense, the story of Thomas Breakwell and May, May Bowles, both of their stories is, is a story of obedience, radiant acquiescence. The husband of Violet Nakshavani, Ali Nakshavani, was once asked while traveling in Africa, what is the sign of a mature Baha'i community? And he said, total obedience. So Dr. Yunus Khan described uh, Abdul Baha receiving letters from Thomas Breakwell. And, and he called it the mysterious communion between the lover and the beloved had no need of the spoken word. He experienced so many things during Thomas Brickwell's short life as a Baha'i before he passed away. And he always talked about communion when he talked about Thomas Brickwell and Abdul Baha. There was this mystical connection between the two. They were so connected. Um, it was so... Um, May, May Bowles also wrote in her memoirs that, that um, Thomas Breakwell was immensely courteous. He was exemplary, exemplary in his politeness. He was intensely fervent. He had so much sympathy, so much genuine love, and he was so eloquent. And he began living such a frugal life walking instead of taking cabs and living in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Paris. And um, this was during the time that the Thomas Breakwell's parents came to visit. Um, and they wanted to take him home and restore him to his family's religion. They disowned him when they weren't able to do that. But then less than two weeks later, believe it or not, Thomas Breakwell's father became a Baha'i. So after many letters to Abdul Baha, Thomas Breakwell reported that he was feeling ill. Um, Mabel's observed signs of his being ill about six months after he returned from pilgrimage. So that would have been September, so around March, March 1902. She started seeing that he was he was starting to get ill. Um, but but uh, so he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. He was wrongly diagnosed at first, and then he was rightly diagnosed with tuberculosis, and he was put in a family doctor's care. But in his letters to Abdul Baha, he he continued to show this radiant acquiescence regarding his condition. Uh, was he, he wasn't he wasn't just content with his suffering. He was he wanted more pain, greater pain. He said, "Suffering is a heady wine. I am prepared to receive the bounty, which is the greatest of all." The, f the torments of the flesh have enabled me to draw nearer to my Lord. That love, I've never read that kind of longing outside of the writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha longing for suffering. Um, regular human beings don't write like that. They just simply don't. Um, so even as his death was approaching, Break, Thomas Breakwell was teaching the Baha'i faith to the other patients in the tuberculosis ward where he was confined, and he died at 7 in the evening on the 13th of June, 1902, at the age of 30, less than one year after becoming a Baha'i. Actually, 11 months. Um, when Thomas Breakwell passed away, Abdul Baha instantly knew he was... He, so this is Yunus Khan now speaking. I was accompanying the master in the evening from the house where he received his visitors to his home by the seaside. All of a sudden, he turned to me and said, have you heard? No, master, I replied. And he said, Breakwell has passed away. I am grieved, very grieved. I have revealed a prayer of visitation for him. It is very moving. So moving that twice I could not withhold my tears when I was writing it. You must translate it well. 
so that whoever reads it will weep. I never knew who had given the master the news of Breakwell's death. If anyone had written or cabled, either in English or French, that communication would have passed through my hands. Two days later, the prayer of visitation was given to me. It wrung one's heart and I could not hold back my tears. I translated it into French and later, with the help of Lua Getzinger, into English. Here are two passages from the Tablet of Visitation of Thomas Breakwell. Now, I really encourage you again to go to the Utterance Project YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. You will see the Tablet of Visitation for Thomas Breakwell. Uh, we published it one year ago in June 2021 uh, on the anniversary of his death on the 13th of June. And when you listen to it in Arabic, the refrain and the rhythm of the Arabic is like is like a sea that like just covers over the pain of Thomas Breakwell's death with like divine mysticism. It's so beautiful. It's like a poem. In Arabic, it's like a poem. It's so vastly superior to the English translation. But, um, you know, I have a favor. Can someone unmute themselves and read these two excerpts while I go get a glass of water? Is, would that be possible? I, vol I volunteer for that task. Thank you so much. I'll be right back. And in passing, 51 years exactly after Thomas Breakwell left this world, I entered it. <gasps> wow. Thank you for reading. Oh, that's wonderful. Thou art become a star in the supernal sky and a lamp amid the angels of high heaven, a living spirit in the most exalted kingdom, throned in eternity. O oh, break well, my dear one, at all times do I call thee to mind. I shall never forget thee. I pray for thee by day, by night. I see thee plain before me, as if in open day. That's so beautifully read. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so Dr. Yunus Khan um, talked about one more thing. Uh, talked about receiving a letter from Thomas Breakwell's father. Uh, Abdul Baha called me one day to his presence to give me letters to translate. There were many envelopes from various places. While examining them still sealed, he all of a sudden picked one and said, how pleasing is the fragrance that emanates from this envelope. Make haste, open it and see where it comes from. Make haste. In it was a postcard. The postcard was colored a beautiful shade and attached to it was a solitary flower, a violet. Written in letters of gold were these words. He is not dead. He lives on in the kingdom of God. Further, there was this sentence. This flower was picked from Breakwell's grave. When I told the master what the message of the postcard was, he at once rose up from his seat, took the card, put it on his blessed brow, and tears flowed from his cheeks. In the letter, Thomas Breakwell's father also said, praise be to the Lord that my son left this world for the next with recognition and love of Abdul Baha. So I have a story that I put right next to Thomas Breakwell's story because it's, it's the same sort of soul. Uh, it's a story about Lua Getzinger, which takes place in 1903. And I have to thank my, uh, my mentor, my Baha'i history mentor, Earl Redman, for helping me narrow down that date because I didn't know. And he's written two books about pilgrims visiting Abdu'l Baha and Lua Getzinger came several times on pilgrimage. So I, I, I needed help. And he, he actually knew because of there was an interaction later on that happened in 1903. So he was able to date the story. So anyway. And Lua Getzinger, incidentally, was part of the very first group of pilgrims that came to visit Abdul Baha in uh, 1898 uh, that was organized by Phoebe Hurst. 
So uh, in the in the early 18th, so this, um, oh gosh, Mr. Izadini, are you still there? I forgot to write down the name of the gentleman that's on the picture. Um, at any point, you can unmute yourself and 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 let us know. Um, Mr. Izadini was kind enough to help me identify this man. I didn't know who it was. Uh, anyway, it is Abu Al Faz. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, in the early 20th century, so many Westerners came to seek uh, to seek Baha'u'llah's presence and to attain his presence, and came all the way to the Holy Land. But not that many were able to come, and the Ottoman government was very, very severe. So, 1903, when this story is taking place, is actually very close to when the. Rep uh, the reincarceration of Abdu Baha and the commission of inquiry of the Ottoman government are going to come 1905, where they wanted to crucify Abdu Baha, they wanted to hang him from the gate, they wanted to exile him to Fizan in the Libyan desert. Um, so it was a time of danger when she came. This time, 1903, was not a really safe time, and it was very, uh, it was very, it was the enemies of the faith and the covenant breakers were very deeply hostile. So uh, Abdul Baha only really invited the people that he felt had the, the necessary wisdom, the patience, um, the discretion to be able to blend in with the local population. And Lua Getziger had all of those qualities. I mean, she had special clothes made so they wouldn't, she, so that she could blend in. Um, and um, she had already come on pilgrimage before, so in 1898. And she, back then, even left a, an impression on the minds and hearts of the local believers, so the people who lived in Akka and Haifa. Uh, 1903, her pilgrimage lasted approximately a year. Um, she wore like this simple dress of the Christian women of Akka. Uh, and she served as an English teacher for the ladies in Abdul Baha's household. Um, her, so the, the, the passion, see, Lua Getzinger was like Thomas Breakwell in her fervor and in her passion. Um, they were sort of the ex expression, they, they were expressions of her faith in, ba in Baha'u'llah. And her every word really deeply moved all of the people that she came into contact with. And um, in, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in, um, in Yunus Khan Afrukte's nine Memories of Nine Years in Akka, he talks about how she seemed to have almost an inextinguishable fire that seemed to rage in her soul. So she never wanted to rest. She threw herself into every single type of service that she could uh, render. From teaching English to correspondence to translation to other kinds of tasks. And at the height of the persecutions that were taking place on the other side of the world, in Yazd, in Isfahan, in, in, in Iran, Lua Getzinger began to start forming an obsession about martyrdom. She wept. She prayed day and night, constantly begging for martyrdom. She threw herself at Abdul Baha's feet several times, begging for the honor of dying as a martyr. She asked if she could go to Persia and proclaim the faith so that she wouldn't be martyred. Um, and she told the Baha'is, I mean, this is how, this is how far this went, this obsession with martyrdom. She told the Baha'is around her what to say what prayers to say, how many times to say them, so that she would become a martyr. And her obsession grew to such a point that she pled her case to become a martyr to every single person she met in Haifa and Akka. Every single one, she asked them, please tell Abdul Baha want to be a martyr. Uh, and she even asked Dr. Afrukte himself to ask Abdul Baha to grant her the honor of martyrdom. So Lua's passionate appeals left and right. I mean, Dr. Afrikte was such a such a poet, such a writer, such a brilliant writer. So her, her, her appeals were so sort of chaotic, right and left, every single person, just like she was just like trying in every possible way to become a martyr. It reminded Dr. Yunus Khan Afrikte of this Persian poem, arrow-like. I release a prayer from every side, hoping one will find its mark and be replied. The story goes on. So every single time anyone brought Lua's petition to the master, 
Abdul Baha would reply in exactly the same way. Tell Lua, to be slain in itself bestows neither rank nor prestige. There are many souls, while not having experience outward martyrdom, are considered martyrs in the path of God. And there are many who have lost their lives, but did not attain the reality of the martyr's rank. Martyrdom is a supremely eminent station granted by Baha'u'llah to whomever he chooses. A soul may not be killed and yet attain the station. I will pray for you to achieve this rank. The reality of martyrdom is service. And you, praise the Lord, have arisen to serve. I will pray for you and I will implore that you may be granted this station, rest assured. So Lua's increasing passion had kind of an unexpected result. Abdu'l-Bahá, <laughs> this is so amazing for so many reasons, but mostly because I love how Abdu'l-Bahá uses her obsession with martyrdom. Oh, God, this is, oh, this is such a great story. Anyway, so Abdu'l-Bahá would send any person who was curious, too curious or insincere, any insincere foreign traveler, any aggressive or argumentative enemy of the faith, any of those people in this group, he would send to Lua Getzinger. And Dr. Afrukte would translate for them. And on those occasions, the magnetic force of Lua Getzinger had such an impact on her listeners that they left, like, contrite and tearful. <laughs> See, it's, it's amazing because... Most people would be like, they have this person obsessed with martyrdom, then did you just ship them off, you know? No. Abdul Baha showed patience and used her fire and her passion against the enemies of the faith. I mean, these people are enemies of the faith. He would send the enemies of the faith to Lua, who was so pure and so enkindled and so on fire that she would dismantle them in one sitting. And Abdul Baha didn't have to worry about spending time with them. So sometimes... <laughs> So sometime in, in 1902 or 1903, Lua confronted uh, Hussein Ali Jahrumi, one of the most notorious covenant breakers of Bombay. Lua overwhelmed Jahrumi with her courageous and fearless assault, and he was forced to admit his shame in tears and penitent and acknowledge the falseness of his beliefs. After a year of pleading, Lua finally gave in to the will of God and listened to Abdul Baha, and in doing so, she attained the reality of the station of martyrdom, which is to die to oneself and live in God. That's what martyrdom is. It's not being shot with bullets, it's not being hung, it's die to oneself and live, you martyr yourself. You die to yourself and you live in God. Yourself no longer exists. That's what martyrdom is. So when she reached that intense spiritual state, then she was given permission to leave the Holy Land. Dr. Afrute was just shocked at her countenance when she was getting ready to leave. He said it was one of the most astonishing things he'd ever seen in his entire period of nine years of service in the Holy Land. Her face was so luminous and so spiritual, and her bearing was transformed. Her bearing was transformed. Um, she had, it, it seemed like, what did he say? He said it was like an angel had been incarnated in the body of a human being. I was never so deeply moved than when I witnessed her tender and kindly disposition as we said our farewells. Never before had I held so wonderful and heavenly a countenance. I gazed at her in utter amazement. The next day, Abdullah asked, did you see Lua when she left? Did you notice her face? and her demeanor? I responded that I had been astonished by her state of spirituality. The master replied, it is a pity that she won't be able to maintain that spirit. It is impossible to remain in that state. Now consider where we find these wandering souls and how we educate them. So, I just want to share my next story is from Amatul Baha Ruhiya Hanu, and it's actually a video. Uh, well, I made it into a video. It is Amatul Baha Ruhiya Hanu speaking on the 21st of June 1970 about the work ethic of the Guardian to. Oh, wait, I haven't shared that, have I? 
Okay, let me just share that. <laughs> I think I think it will be more helpful if I share it. <laughs> All right. So, is it working? Are you seeing? Uh, let's see. What is happening here? Are you seeing the black screen? Yeah, it's loading. Okay, great. Is it okay? All right. So this is a little video I put together about three or four sentences in this same talk from 21 June 1970 to the National Baha'i Youth Conference in Evanston, Illinois. And I love them because listen to how she speaks about Shoghi Effendi's work ethic. Another strange. Can you hear the audio? Yes, we hear it. about the Guardian when he used to write was that I can't remember his ever giving up and I've seen him struggle um, a half an hour three quarters of an hour Oops. with a long sentence where this could not be done in English he had this infinite, infinite capacity for work. I think that people must realize that although Shoghi Effendi was the sign of God on earth, the descendant of manifestation of God and of Abdul Baha, nevertheless, in, aside from all of that spiritual power and heritage and divine guidance and everything else, I have often thought that he was a genius in his own right. And I think one of the definitions of genius is a person who has the capacity for a tremendous amount of persevering work. You know, in science, in art, in music, in literature, if you study those people that get to the very top and are outstanding, so often it has been done by a very, very simple process of just hard work. They didn't work three or four hours and then lie down and have a, a ginger beer and look at the television. They went right straight on, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, 16 hours. Okay. So, now, stop share, come back here. What? I didn't want that to play. Okay, I just have my conclusion and then we'll have questions. I can't wait. All right, let's see. Share and okay, there you go. All right, so that was this. That was this. Very happy. I love this picture of the two of them. I tried to find a picture when they were both kind of the same age. Uh, that's as close as, well, I mean, not really, but they're young. Both of them are young. Um, in this picture, Shogi Finn is probably about 10 years older than um, Mary Maxwell. That's the video we just saw. So uh, really connected to Lua Getzinger and Thomas Breakwell is our last story, my fav one of my favorites. Probably my favorite, um, the story of Hand, Hand of the Cause, Keith Ransom Keller's last month in Iran. So Keith Ransom Keller, the future Hand of the Cause, was an American believer, and she was a woman of so much dignity and ability and character. And she had a way of presenting herself that was so just aristocratic and well-born. So when she arrived in Haifa as a pilgrim in 1932, the year that the greatest holy leaf passed away, Shoghi Effendi kept her in Haifa, for several weeks and personally tutored her on Islam, on the history of Persia, and briefed her about Iran for a very, very, very special mission. Shoghi Effendi hoped that um, Keith Ransom Keller would be able to gain a greater freedom for the faith and a measure of official recognition because of her bearing, basically, and that she would be able to access uh, uh, the Shah. And, so when, when Mrs. Ransom Keller arrived in, in Iran, her mission essentially failed. 
because the Shah refused to receive her. But her visit to Persia was still a resounding success. So we have two pictures here, one of uh, Keith Ransom Keller with the women of Iran in, in one of the cities, and another with the men. Um, and there were there's so many pictures of Keith Ransom Keller in Persia. The Persians absolutely adored her. She went all over. She it was such a success when she visited the communities. And um, so Shoghi Effendi had briefed uh, Keith Ransom Keller so profoundly on the development of the administrative order in Persia that she was able to infuse the Persian Baha'i community with a new awareness of their future mission. And uh, tragically, Keith Ransom Keller died very suddenly from smallpox on the 23rd of October 1933 in Isfahan. And Shoghi Effendi cabled five days later, cabled America, saying, there's only part of the quote here, but I'll read the whole thing. Keith's precious life offered up sacrifice, beloved cause in Baha'u'llah's native land. On Persian soil, for Persia's sake, she encountered, challenged, and fought forces of darkness with high distinction, indomitable will, unswerving exemplary loyalty. Mass of her helpless Persian brethren mourn sudden loss, their valiant emancipator. American believers, grateful and proud, memory, their first and distinguished martyr, first martyr, American believers, grateful and proud memory, their first and distinguished martyr, sorrow-stricken, I lament, earthly separation, invaluable collect collaborator, unfailing counselor, esteemed and faithful friend, urge local spiritual assemblies befittingly organize memorial gatherings in memory of one whose international services entitle her eminent rank among hands of the cause of Baha'u'llah. I get goosebumps every time I talk about Keith Ransom Keller. Um, and you, if you know me, you know that I never like to have the last word in any of my talks. I always last the last word to Baha'u'llah, to Abdul Baha, or to hands of the cause or anybody else. In this case, the last words in this talk are belonging to Keith Ransom Keller. These are the last, these are some of her last words ever written in her diary a few days before her passing. I want you to, real, to, to recognize the use of the word sacrifice in this letter and sacrifice in the letter of Shoghi Effendi. At the time that he wrote that, he had not seen her diary probably because it was only five days after her passing. So with that, I will leave you. I have fallen, though I never faltered. Months of effort with nothing accomplished is the record of what confronts me. If anyone in future should be interested in this thwarted adventure of mine, he alone can say whether near or far from the seemingly impregnable heights of complaisance and indifference, my tired old body fell. The smoke and din of battle are today too dense for me to ascertain whether I moved forward or was slain in my tracks. Nothing in this world is meaningless, suffering least of all. Sacrifice with its attendant agony is a germ, an organism. Man cannot blight its fruition as he can the seeds of the earth. Once sown, it blooms, I think, forever in the sweet fields of eternity. Mine will be a very modest flower, perhaps like the single tiny forget-me-not, watered by the blood of Kudus that I plucked in the Sabzi Maidan of Barfouche. Should it ever catch the eye, may one who seems to be struggling in vain garner it in the name of Shoghi Fendi and cherish it for his dear remembrance. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. This. Welcome. I'm so happy. This is wonderful. Yes, very much so. Very much so. So there's a question that we have for all of you here who are participating. We understand that there is very little time left really for questions today, but is there a question that you absolutely cannot hold on to and you need to ask now? Please raise your hand or unmute at this point.
All right, I think we're good to go. Oh, there's a question. Okay, Regina asked, and this is a good question. When is Violetta coming back? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm already scheduled for January, and I'm struggling to find a topic. I have so many options. Uh, Mr. Izadini, I'm going to have to talk to you about that because I have several ideas. I would like your, your thoughts. Anybody else who has any thoughts, anything you're interested in, I'm going to put my email. Why don't you email me? And uh, if something you say, like, strikes my inspiration, then I'll do that. Is that did I spell it correctly? Yes, gmail.com. You, you wrote yeah, Violetta yeah. Z at Gmail. I was supposed to give this talk in January, <laughs> so now I don't have a talk for January. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm so sorry that I uh, used up the whole time. I didn't think it was going to last this long. No, but, don't uh, be. Don't be. I, I, was, I wasn't making a comment. I was just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> who are here you know <laughs> thank you guys who stayed the whole time that's so nice it was so wonderful to be with you yeah, um absolutely. if people really have questions i can create another zoom i have a zoom i can just post a link um but if not then that's great so I people are online saying that. thank you yeah. in the chat people are saying thank you okay. and and uh, oh, Simone gave, yeah. gave a good point. Well, it is January, so you did give you a January talk. In That's January. right. It's on the 23rd. 23rd of January. Yeah, our next <laughs> session is on the 23rd of January. And for those of you who have questions for Violetta, I'll spell it out. Violetta, V-I-O-L-E-T-T-A, Z as in Z, at gmail.com. You can email her your questions yeah. and she'll be very happy. To I know I know. sometimes people want uh, links to sources or they want to see the YouTube video again or something like that. So, yeah, feel free to email me. I love to answer questions. Um, yes. And further, for those of you who are joining us through the Clue Water Baha'is channels, you're always welcome to contact us with questions. And we can get you yeah. all in connected yeah. to each other. So yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. We can we can find a way. <laughs> when there's a will, there's a way. Or as, find this. <laughs> there's a quote attributed so to Abdul Baha. When there is love, nothing is too much trouble, and there is always time. I love it. I love it. I love coming to Clearwater. This is my home. I love you guys. Love everybody. Yeah. Have a wonderful 2023. Uh, yeah. Full of love and discoveries and happiness, and hopefully many more meetings where we can be together. Yeah. So in about a little more than two weeks, we'll be seeing you again. We appreciate it. <laughs> I don't think it started. <laughs> Well, we wish all of you here who have joined us a very beautiful evening. It is about 1230 now, Eastern Standard, and we look forward to seeing you all again on Sundays at 11 a.m. Again, please check out the Clearwater Baha'is on YouTube. You'll see the recording of this video on the Clearwater Baha'is channel, so you can share it with whoever you wish. And further, you also have the Facebook for the Baha'i Center of Clearwater and, of course, the website clearwaterbahais.org. Best wishes, everyone, and have a beautiful